we always hear about how, you know, you never pay the ransomware payment, all that jazz. Again, in an ideal world, we wouldn't. But if you are a hospital and you, for some reason, have gotten a ransomware infection on your internal network that could put lives at risk, then you have to, that's, that's a very different situation, all right? Nobody wants to do it, but someone at that org has to quantify the, the cost of a human life. That's, and that's not fun. So again, definitely a serious problem. And Luke, I'm gonna let you take it away, my man. Let's hear it for him. Thank you. So I had to export this from uh, Google Slides so the images are a little pixelated. Please bear with me, it should have come out okay enough. The, uh, the name of the talk, Attacking Healthcare and the Life Sciences uh, Offensive Past of Catalyst Travel. My name is Luca. Uh, you can contact me through uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. About me, I currently work at GitLab doing security compliance. Uh, previously managed healthcare for uh, our work security and compliance for a healthcare company. Um, and then before that, for a, a healthcare provider. Uh, been doing consulting and freelance work forever. Uh, spent about, my, my path to security was a little non traditional. I spent a lot of time in the lab. Um, up until about five years ago, you know, I was minutes away from going into a PhD program to do research. Um, and so my focus was on genomics and gene editing. And so I had a lot of hands on lab work. And so I got to, that, that was the inspiration for this talk. I got to see how everything worked. Um, you know, what systems are used, how are they used, and what, what are the implications should something go wrong. Uh, grew up trying to break everything, and so I was a gamer. Uh, spent a lot of time just, you know, figuring out how, you know, how do you make an inbox, um, and how do wall hacks work. And Diablo 2 seems lucrative if you can get a bot um, and sell items online. Let's do that and Punk Buster uh, for like games like Soldier Fortune 2 never worked, and so I spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, figure out how that all worked. About this talk and, and some uh, disclaimers and, and constraints. So I, I I spent a lot of time thinking about what is this talk going to be, um, and I as I was making the slides, I identified uh, this problem uh, with a new domain in healthcare. It's the intersection of research and care that you actually provide to patients. And so I want to take this opportunity, this talk, to um, talk about some of the, the threats that maybe didn't exist 10 years ago, but that are very real today, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and then disclaimers and constraints. I've signed so many NDAs, I don't know what I can and can't talk about. I've worked in so many different environments, touching EHR and natural providers. Uh, you know, I've worked at a serious clinical research lab. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I just can't talk about because I have first-hand knowledge about it. Um, there will be, at times, uh, things that um, I need to uh, you know, follow up with a good old. Um, and so you might uh, try to get the idea that way. Um, also, I'm not trying to tell anybody uh, you know, what your threat model should or shouldn't be. That's something you do to decide. I don't know what your business needs are. You know, I don't know what equipment you do or don't have, uh, what your goals are or aren't. And so the name of this talk is intentionally the offensive task, path to less travel. And so this might not and probably is not applicable today in your environment, but it might be. Uh, this is more to raise awareness of a larger issue that I see that isn't being talked about um, at large. So the, the, I, I like to start off with, you know, if, if you're an adversary, how do you get information? And in healthcare, there are a couple of really good ways that you can get some really good information from some public sources. So the first is the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. And so if you have a residency or fellowship program, you are uh, ACGME um, uh, certified, or you're accredited by the ACGME. So luckily for us, they have a website where you can get all the information you could possibly want, right? So uh, here's uh, one page on their website where you can filter through specialty institution. You can find just about anything. And so I'm from Washington State. I come from the Seattle area. I don't want to pick on the University of Washington. I, I just, I'm going to filter through Washington and I'm just going to pick the very first result. This is completely random. I have nothing against the University of Washington. There's no reason I'm picking that. <laughs> So you, I, I go into, I search for Washington State. The very first program you see here is Allegheny University of Washington. 
um, here in Seattle. Great program. I'm going to pick the very first one that's completely random. Again, nothing specific to do with the new go. When you go to this page, you, you can get a lot of information. So usually you'll have uh, director information and coordinator information. Um, this is all public knowledge, so I didn't censor uh, any of the data because you can go out without a subscription, without a paywall, find this information. But kind of the point is, you know, if you want to get the director's um, uh, email address, you can just get it. If you want to get the phone number, fax number, you can just get it. Um, and usually there will be a coordinator there as well. In this case, um, you have, actually here you just have the coordinator, but not the director. If you go through the listing, you'll be able to find those. So later on in the page, you can see there's a link to the actual department. And again, I, I, it's the first one on the list. I just have to pick something. And this is just to demonstrate. You know what the program is about. Allergy and, allergy and immunology, you know the specifics of the program because the accreditation information is public. And so when you go on here, most universities, they're going to list their fellows, their leadership, administrative staff, um, and so on. Uh, you can get their phone numbers. You can get their email addresses. It's all public. And so if you want to be very targeted about who you're going after, there are ways you can get that reliable information, um, and they will respond to the, the emails. And we'll talk about why that's all. Next is uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so when you think about that, you usually think about Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but probably what you don't think about is macro. So who here knows what macro? One person in the back. So macro is essentially, uh, you know, there was a lot of things uh, broken with how we were doing payments, and we needed to uh, when you shift, which is the health insurance program for the children. Um, but part of what this did was um, it created MITS, which is a payments, and MITS is essentially moving us towards health-based care. And so now we're collecting uh, these patient outcomes. And uh, we're reporting it to the government and these other private registries. And we'll see why that's important in a little bit. So if you go to the quality payment program, this is the website CMS hosts for MITS, you can get a lot of information. Right? One of the things you can do is you can find out who the QCDRs are. So those are the qualified clinical data registries. So at my last company, we work with QCDRs. So these are people that can uh, collect, store, and submit this data. Um, this quality data to CMS. And they publish everything out there. So the way QCDRs work is there's no one template for what you can collect and how you can collect. You can even create your own quality measures. And so in my last company, we made our own quality measures for orthopedic outcomes, right? So everyone's doing something else. If you want to be really targeted about that, you can just open the spreadsheet that they have on their website that anybody can access. You can find out, you can find email addresses, you can find phone numbers, but more importantly, you can find out what data they're collecting, what services they're offering, and uh, you can usually tie it back into a client because everybody has a press release these days saying, we are now working with University X. Um, so you can be very, very specific. Now you can say, okay, well, is this provider, are they part of MIT? Similarly, there's a public tool you can access today um, where you can uh, put their MPI number and um, uh, see if they are a, a part of MIT. Chances are they are. There's a couple of uh, exclusions. Some people are using something called an APM. That's not here or there, but you can, you can actually check this. So, the previous slide, that, that tool would ask for an MPI number. Well, how do you get somebody's MPI number? Well, there's a tool for that. You can go and you can find a person's MPI number just by searching on this tool that's available today for anybody to access. Probably most important to this talk is using research papers to enumerate the target's environment. And so how many of you have gone to like Nature or Cell and read through a peer-reviewed scientific um, research paper to get uh, detailed, intimate information about the software and equipment that your target uses? <laughs> one perfect. So I just picked one on PLOS One. This is a free research article you can read today. And so if you're just going about your day and you see this, you're like, little cells may think synapses by inhibiting an activity dependent on the cardiac signal. You're like, cool, why does this matter? Well, there are a couple of things going on in this slide. First, you know every single person that works on it. And we know from the previous slide, 
their email addresses are probably on that website. So you can get their contact information, and most of these are going to be postdocs um, or PhD students. And so they're going to respond to your emails if you send something cool, or hey, check out my article. They're probably going to open it. Um, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on in science. Um, but you also find what institutions they're part of, and so you can start to put together that picture. So you read this, you're going through the article, whatever, this is cool, glial cell synapses, you know, why, why does this matter? Well, when you read through this, you're like, okay, you know, total RNA was isolated from embryonic or postnatal diaphragm muscle tri-provision, whatever, that doesn't mean anything to me. But then you, you start reading through it a little bit more, and you, you start to uncover a really interesting story about uh, what kind of environment they and so they make mention of uh, the RNA was evaluated with a picoquant chip on a bioantimicer. So the picoquant chip is going to be for the Agilent 2100 bioantimicer. Okay, so now you have one piece of equipment, you know uh, which model they're using, you know what chip they're using, and, and then you can find out what software they're using. Okay, that's interesting, there's probably not much more. But then you kind of dig deeper and then you find, oh, they're also using a uh, diagonal bioreactor. Okay, that's cool, there's probably not much more information. Oh wait, they're also using a rote life cycle or 4800 real-time PCR. Okay, anything else? Oh, they're using a Vibrat CFX uh, Connect real-time PCR. And so we'll, we'll go into more detail why this is important and why um, you and, and these institutions should care about all of this. So where do you find these publications? You have somebody's name, you know what institution uh, they're, you're, they're a part of. Everyone's getting published. If you want to get into med school, you're probably nowadays you're probably going to have to be published in some way or another. That's obviously not true um, in all cases, but more and more it's getting more competitive. If you're a PhD student, you're expected to be published by the time you're graduated. If you're an MD PhD student, don't even talk about it. You're going to be published. If you're a researcher, obviously you have many publications, but where do you find them? Well, you know you have Science and Nature, which are like the big ones. That's where all the most impactful stuff. Goes, that's where you're going to see mostly the Harvards and the University of Washington's and Stanford's. Um, the key, interesting, well, University of Buffalo has a really good um, uh, basic science and research program. So they do a lot of really cool things with like uh, demyelinating uh, neuropathies. Um, you can also search PubMed, Google Scholar. Uh, some of these are free. Some of those are, are not free. So like Science and Nature, you have to you have to pay for it. Now, I'm not saying I ever use the service, but if you're you know, going through a team engagement and you're an adversary and you don't want to pay the 60 to 100 bucks, you can't find this thing that was published yesterday. Um, I, and I can't say that I've ever used this website, um, but you know, if you go onto it and you put in the URL of the research article, um, who knows what will happen. But you just don't have to do it. Again, I've, I've never used it. I, I don't know. Um, Fascinating emergence of medical blogging. So this is really cool. This is the social media era reaching doctors and especially med students who grew up with Facebook and Instagram. Um, this one's really interesting. And so I, I block out the face because I, I don't want to, you know, call specific people out. Uh, but this is a, a pretty popular one. Um, and so what's wrong with this picture? Well, what's wrong with this picture is I know who the doctor is, I know what ward this is, I know what department this is, but I also now know what EHR they're using, I know that they're virtualizing it, I know what operating system they're using, and I know, um, you know what applications they're using, and I can probably from this uh, get application um, or, or uh, software versions from this. Now I also know that I can find these people's email addresses, and I know that if they're on rotation, they're probably, in this war, they're probably going to talk about it on their blog, um, and they're probably going to open their emails here, because maybe I've seen them open their emails here, and so now I can start to put together a picture of, okay, if I'm targeting someone in a very specific way, you know, this was like 10 minutes of being on YouTube. This isn't anything special. I just, for preparation, I just literally went to YouTube and I a medical blogger, but they're, they're everywhere. That's an interesting one. This is another interesting one. So, you know, again, from this I can glean what operating system you're using. I can uh, probably gather that you're using certain applications. I see uh, Internet Explorer is still um, very, very popular. I can see that they have access to it on the Internet. I also know what ward this is a part of, and I, I can start to figure out if somebody is on rotation here, they're probably going to be using this computer for research. And if I send them an email and they open it here, 
all of these applications are there for the target. Old school Windows yeah. And so you look at this and you say, okay, well this this isn't a big deal. This is just they're going through their medical textbook. It's an ebook. You know, science is advancing. But but what do you see wrong with this picture? And this is just one example of many times I've seen this. Like, what's wrong? Up in the top right. Yep, up in the top right, you have information about the network. And so it's like, I spent 10 minutes doing this. This isn't like, I mean, this is, you know, I spent hours and hours obsessing over finding this one shot. This is me, you know, dragging the icon from the YouTube videos to see the frames to kind of, like, yeah, you know, find places in the video where they're just watching videos. This isn't, you know, some, you know, magic that I'm using to, to find this information. And so I, I specifically picked this one because everything is not identified, but it shows that, you know, I have the username, I have the address, the HCP server, and um, later on in the frame in the video, you can actually see uh, what service pack they're using and the version. Mm -hmm. And so now I've just enumerated your entire environment, and it's probably not very hard to find something on a form somewhere that I can reuse. Or maybe I have something in my toolkit because, you know, everybody sort of started really going at it when this was around. And then here I can tell, you know, uh, what phones you're using. I can see what security solution you're using. This is probably the, the least outrageous example. Um, but, you know, here I can see that they're using Improvata. So, you know, if, if maybe I'm an Improvata enthusiast or there's no other way in, I now know what your entire enterprise uses uh, for your protection and I can sort of figure out that you use the same sign <coughs> So what are the targets of interest? When we're talking about healthcare and the life sciences, what's really interesting to look at? Um, and, and so when I was doing research, uh, so I, I did some research at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research uh, Center, and uh, at the same time I was IT manager for a healthcare provider. So I'm looking at all of this stuff from the security perspective. I broke up. I, I grew up breaking everything. I'm just interested. How can I exploit this and, and get a little farther? And it turns out there's actually a lot you can do and there are a lot of targets. The first is patient outcomes and care quality initiatives. So my last company I worked at a patient reported outcomes vendor. Um, and there are a lot of problems with this system from the vendors to the places that you go to upload these massive databases of uh, uh, you know, patient data and, and uh, care outcomes. But probably most concerning is like if you've had a hip replacement, you're probably in one of these, and that's kind of problematic for a few reasons. So like, there's AJRR. And so who here has ever submitted to AJRR? Like, everyone's doing it. If you think your hospital isn't doing it, they're probably doing it because you're getting money from this. This isn't a, a technical decision or security or compliance decision. This is your hospital or your clinic's making more money. So what are the common third-party vendors? Well, there are many of them. You can target many of them. I can't talk specifically about most of these because I've worked with them in some insubstantial way. But you have PFAS vendors, um, you have patient reported outcome vendors, you have EHR integration vendors, and so it, I probably shouldn't call specific vendors by name. But you do have them. Um, you know, you have quality submission preparation firms because this is all logistically very difficult. And so right now you're probably thinking, okay, that's fine. But we will we'll get to why this is all kind of a problem. Electronic health records, I really wanted to talk about this, but I've worked really um, hands-on with EHR integrations and specific EHR vendors. I just can't talk about it. There's some really good uh, information out there on um, attacking HL7 interfaces um, to change data, to remove data. And so imagine if you're a patient and you're allergic to penicillin, uh, penicillin and you're no longer allergic to penicillin, that's obviously going to be a problem. And like, how do you detect that? You, you know, are people really putting IDS and IPS um, in between their um, HL7 traffic stream? Probably not. Maybe some people are, but probably not. Connected equipment, and, and so this is going to be the, the uh, focus of this talk, is when we think about equipment in healthcare, we usually think about medical devices, and so there was a great talk um, about that um, glucose reader earlier today. That's usually what we think about. But if you're part of a nonprofit research center or an academic institution, there is so much more to this. And 
healthcare is becoming so much more than just these cardiac implants or these um, you know, uh, devices reading vital signs. It's way beyond that at this point. We'll, we'll see why that's important in the future. So you consider all the moving parts. There's so much going on. There's DNA sequencing. Think about personalized medicine. PCR machines for amplifying DNA, microarray uh, instruments, flow cytometers uh, for research, there's medical devices, um, you have uh, like heat and cold baths for your samples. And, and the list goes on and on. There's, there's a lot going on there. So it's not just you know, your typical um, medical devices, which there's a lot of attention on, and I'm very happy about that, but the story is much more expensive than that. Big problem with a lot of this is everybody's trying to get an edge. Everything's cloud connected now. You know, there's just vulnerability after vulnerability, um, not just for things that you put in your body, but also things that are used for research. That's a problem. And there's also the software toolkit. And so most of these are Windows-based uh, softwares. There's no ASLR. Um, they, you, they just take any file that you want. I'm not saying anything, but if you were to go and you were to fuzz these with AFL, you might find something. And no antivirus is going to detect it, by the way. You know, these, these files are random in nature, right? There is no antivirus on the planet that's going to detect something that's going to get your system um, with this. So just something to think about. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of all of this. I'm talking about all this equipment, and you're like, okay, sure, we'll do whatever. Um, but, but what are the actual attacks that we can do? And so this is going to be half talking about that, the attacks and half talking about the science, because the context here matters. How this stuff is used really, really matters a lot. So going back to um, the patient-reported outcomes in AARR and how your data is probably on it, what, what's the problem with this patient? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Uh, yeah, there, there, there's no TLS. Like there's, there's just nothing. It's one of the largest orthopedic uh, data registries on the planet. There's no TLS. I've reported this too. And I worked with them, I reported it, it's still not there. So what's the problem here? The registry login, right? It's, uh, there's, again, no TLS. If you go to the actual third party vendor that hosts the, the database, Yes, there's TLS and their security is probably pretty good, but everybody goes through it from here. Now, how hard would it be to find some bug in an outdated WordPress site with no TLS and no sub resource integrity? I don't know, I've never tried it, <laughs> but if you were to try it, you might find something. And here's another example, Marquee. So if you're from Michigan, this is the, the big um, uh, quality database in Michigan, there are many of them. And same thing, no TLS, and, and this of course is being reported. And then here you have your user login, um, no TLS. This is an old WordPress site. When you link to the database here, how hard would it be to um, find something wrong with this website, change the link to the database, steal the credentials, and get into all of this patient data? I don't know, it might be difficult. And this speaks to a larger problem with um, quality outcomes is all of these um, are supported by these big insurance companies. And so in the example of Marquee, right, it's part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield of, of Michigan quality initiative, right? And Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't really vet these vendors for security. They don't really have standards. You sign a piece of paper and you say, okay, we're going to collaborate. There isn't really much going on there. And so here you can see marquees on the list. And again, this is not, has, has all been reported. So there's no avenue actually for you to um, report these, these issues and get a serious response, which is part of the larger problem where like, they already know about this. And, and it's just falling on deaf ears, which is unfortunate. But I, again, I'd like to talk more about the actual patient outcomes uh, vendors, but I just, there's no way. And then here's valuepartnerships.com. Uh, this is where you learn about all that information. And you go to register for all these programs. And um, again, no TLS. Um, in corporate terms, we would call that a trend. <laughs> so this was a, as I was putting together this presentation, uh, this came out. Who here has read this uh, publication about uh, changing the MRI images? 
to a few people about it. We've, we've heard about it. So for a long time, we kind of thought, eh, nobody can really do this. I'm sure there's a lot of security going on at Phillips and all these other companies. Researchers from uh, Israel were essentially uh, able to put together a working group concept that um, they could change the MRI images to show that either a tumor was there when it was not, or to show that there was no tumor when there was. It's practically undetectable. Um, I know it's a miracle. Um, it's practically undetectable. Uh, there's not much you can do. Somebody can get inside your network, which in healthcare probably isn't very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, like how do you trust your images, right? And this, this speaks to, this is a proof of concept, not just for this MRI, but for every other device that you see in a, a hospital environment. And so I, I really, it was really important for me to put this in here because um, I, I want to show that like people are looking at this and they're getting good at it. And this information is now in public, so if you want to learn about it, you absolutely can. So here they just say that you have a bunch of imaging service uh, uh, services open, exposed to the public internet. Um, there were, what, 1,849 of them, plus the 842 back days. And so here's just that FDA website showing that you know this stuff is happening to medical devices all the time. And so we know about the medical devices. The MRI machine is a little more concerning than, than things in the past, but what's really the problem here? Well, this is this uh, 1800 page. This is the gold standard for um, how do you design and secure your network for medical devices. It's for you know wireless infusion pumps, but it's more or less the same thing. Everyone's going to have an architecture like this or a, a couple of notches below. And this is essentially what it looks like, and you know, luckily. VLANs are used, but you know it's it's a traditional you know hardened in the perimeter network. There's there's no zero trust. That's a big problem. When you're in, you're in, um, and we'll talk about more why you know these VLANs and these security appliances kind of in between um, don't really matter because we've already solved for that problem. If you're in the network, like it's, it's if you're if you're motivated, that's not going to stop you. But first, I want to talk about this. This is the Ion Torrent PGM, personal genome machine. Um, back in 2003, we just wrapped up the human, human genome project. It took us, what, 15, 20 years to sequence the first human genome. Um, it took about $5 billion. And now we have a machine, not necessarily, this, this isn't the best machine to do it, but now you have machines that can do it in a few days for a few thousand dollars. So the advancement in technology has gone far. But these devices are really important because they're used in um, uh, verifying everything that happens in science, right? And so when you create something, let's say a gene therapy, the way you verify it is with a machine like this. This is the architecture of that machine. You have an ion PGM torrent, uh, ion PGM torrent server, which is just kind of you log in. It, it's pretty much an outdated Ubuntu box uh, with more CVEs than um, this entire conference combined. Um, I wouldn't know this, but it might be. Um, and then you're connected to the, the uh, genome machines, the, the actual sequencers, um, and the firmware is public and anybody can download it. And we'll talk later about, well, what if you just PGP encrypt your, your firmware packages? Well, there are private keys out there for those, and you can just get them from the machines because they all need the same private key. And it's internet connected too. Um, and so the way these, uh, these um, so this equipment is in any healthcare environment. If you're a substantial healthcare environment, you're probably going to have some sort of sequencing. You're probably going to have a pathology lab. You're probably going to have a research program. Your doctors are probably going to be doing clinical research. So that's the big problem. So here I just want to uh, highlight the point that these devices are not made with security in mind. Right, so here you have a remote connection agent. They recommend that you open four for free and 22 for SSH remote support. Um, and, and this is all done through a really, really outdated Ubuntu box. Um, and it's unlike, the, so it's a genome sequencer. And you think, oh, well, how am I going to compromise the genome sequencer? It's, it's, it's just a host that's outdated, right? Um, it's, it's not going to take much more to, to go after this. I just want to highlight the point that we know it's an issue because the user manuals are public, so we can find all of this um, uh, publicly. And you see that outbound internet access is done through 
port 80, HTTP. Yeah, one way to do it. And this, this goes back to what we were talking about with the firmware, right? So yes, it's encrypted, that's nice. It's gonna stop me for a little bit. But as you're going through this process, um, there's this guy with a dog in his uh, profile picture, he might be me. Um, it only works if you don't put the same private key on every single device. Um, and if you're part of that community that's looking at this stuff, you can get the private keys anyway. It doesn't really matter. I mean, so, and then you start talking about, okay, well, how do I get remote connection? Well, some devices, not, not necessarily the ION PGM, may have hard-coded credentials that can take you um, directly into a hospital's uh, VLAN where all their research division and all of their other research equipment is, and nobody knows about it. Because how many of you here, um, if you work in a healthcare setting, work with your principal investigators to inventory all devices that are purchased through an R01 device? Like, like you can hear that and you're like, what's an R01 event? And, and that's kind of the problem. This is part of the same network infrastructure that's going to your MRI machines and your CAT scans and the you know, tools you're using to you know, measure uh, vitals. It, it's all going through the same place. And we saw what that network architecture looks like. That's the best practice. A big problem is that cloud enablement. So a lot of this stuff is going onto the cloud for one reason or another. There's also a mobile app earlier in this conference. Uh, if you went to that um, uh, talk about the glucose meter, there was also an app, and through some certificate pending magic and a little bit of basic defensive security, you were able to gain full access to that app. And so this right here is a thermocycler. Um, this is what you use to sort of unwind the DNA, open it up. It's part of every standard research work. And this here is just a basic Sanger sequencer. It's also cloud connected. This is what you use to sequence your DNA. Um, it, it's also cloud connected. You can control it through the cloud connected app. It all goes through the same place. You can self host. Nobody does that. Everybody uses the SaaS offering. But what's the problem with this cloud hosted um, you know, application or these sequencers that are handling? Uh, clinically, uh, you know, these mission critical, mission critical clinical workloads. I don't know. I don't know. Like, this is a tough one to say. I can't really spot what's wrong, but if you were a security professional, you might be able to solve this puzzle. I'll leave that up to you. And I, I just removed it because I don't want to do that. I've reported this. It's on a single EC2 instance. No load balancer, no security appliance, no WAP, nothing. It's just EC2. A single EC2 instance. So this is a, an NMR machine. Um, well, this one isn't actually an NMR No, it's not. This actually, this is a mass spectrometer that uh, looks at protein. And this is important, again, in every clinical workflow, and it's the same thing. It's run with um, it, it, everything's essentially Ubuntu renamed to OS 14, or whatever it is, right? Um, and they're all outdated. Um, and I, I have a suspicion, or cannot confirm this, that none of them use something like Jira, which would which would be great, but they don't really. And so here's another problem with this device. Okay, that's one way to do it. Um, Web-based remote support. Antivirus and endpoint protection is probably one of uh, my, my favorite things to talk about because it's so prevalent in healthcare. Now, I'll just preface this by saying I, I'm not as intense about this as some of the researchers out there on antivirus, but I do remember uh, writing my first little bit of code uh, to completely take down an infrastructure uh, through denial of service by just sending a file to a mail server. It's a big problem. So this is uh, Elisa Shevchenko, she's a security researcher, um, and she, she made a really good thread about um, antiviruses. So she says, one thing I like about attacking antivirus software is that it architecturally includes every conceivable, conceivable attack vector, uh, format parsing, a system, com OLE, ActiveX, browser extensions, 
uh, kernel modules with ioctl, um, and in this industry, dynamic base flash pretty much doesn't exist um, because of performance issues. And so, uh, this is well documented in the antivirus package handbook. I strongly recommend that read. Um, so, it is what it is. Um, then, in the middle, there will be updates. Simlink issues, uh, zero, uh, ring zero, JavaScript interpreter, emulators, DLL side loading, third party software, web, web interfaces to some fancy open source database. And so if you've ever deployed one of these things, you, you know what that's talking about. Dozens of open ports. ESET has about 20 if you use um, their, uh, their web based thing. Most of them are open to the public because it needs to communicate somehow. Um, and then same for Linux, Android, and iOS. Low bar for entry, and so that's that's high praise. Um, the vector, this vector in all huge. So kind of taking a step back, usually what you do is you run a fuzzer, you find what random file can I generate to make this thing crash? Is there a way I can exploit privileges? Here, 1% of the total attack surface, people are starting to look at these other things. She says she did her first antivirus project probably around the same time when she was a network analyst. She repeats it a few once in a few years uh, just to refresh her reverse engineering skills. And so the security for antivirus is, isn't isn't really intense. Like there's a lot going there. It's getting better. Microsoft is doing some cool stuff with Windows Defender. Um, you know, ASLR is going to eventually be enabled on every single module that's loaded, um, and they're sandboxing. Half of the vendors out there still do not sandbox anything. Um, and most antiviruses reuse some other companies anyway, right? So what you might be Bob's accounting antivirus might actually be using the uh, antivirus. So they, they lease those things out just like uh, T-Mobile leases out their long time. So this is, you, know, you might be thinking, okay, why are we talking about antiviruses? Well, the problem is, antiviruses are everywhere, right? They're everywhere in healthcare. We'll talk about why that is. And so has anybody really looked at this? Have antiviruses been exploited in any meaningful way? And the answer is yes. And so Tavis Armani is very outspoken about antiviruses. I love his threads. Um, about antiviruses and, and uh, how much of a disaster they can be if done wrong. This was one of uh, the first great papers, in my opinion, about antivirus exploitation because it highlighted so many different uh, problems. The chaos a motivated attacker could cause to these systems, namely something that has Sophos installed, um, is a realistic global threat. This is a Project Zero researcher, and, you know, kind of churns out these papers all the time. Um, Sophos products should only ever be considered for low value non-critical systems and never deployed on networks or environments where complete compromise of adversaries would be inconvenient. And so the problem is in healthcare, this is everywhere. And we'll, we'll actually see a diagram how prevalent this is. So this is a real problem. This isn't just, you know, some people are kind of looking at it, it's a hardened target, only nation states are doing like, like People are doing this as hobbyist researchers. They're um, getting system access by, uh, you know, having people load the web page. This isn't an insignificant problem. And if you're in a healthcare network that has antivirus installed on every single endpoint and every end user is protected by an antivirus, you know, you can obviously use this to your advantage. So here are the considerations um, uh, or the recommendations that uh, Tab is having in this paper about SOPOS. And I think this was back in 2012, um, so it's since changed. But I just want to demonstrate the point that this is an ongoing problem, and it started long ago. This isn't something new that people are just now talking about. It says, exclude SOPOS products from consideration for high value networks and assets. And so if you have an antivirus, let's say it, it can be anti-antivirus. I don't want to pick on SOPOS or any other vendor. But if that's what's protecting your MRI machine, or if that's what's protecting you from people getting to your MRI machine or your genome sequencers, then like that's a problem. That's a really big problem. When you have a security researcher uh, making a recommendation like this, this is a strong recommendation. And it should indicate to everyone that there's a larger problem at play here. And so if I'm going, you know, if I'm ever doing an assessment into a healthcare network, one of the things I go for first is an antivirus. 
you have, if you're a patient reported out from center, I hope nobody goes out to me for a violated NDA, um, you know, we have something called capture rate. Why is capture rate important? Because you need a high percentage of patients who get the survey to fill it out so you can get financial reimbursement. Now, well, how do most vendors do this? Well, they do it through email because it's most convenient. And that's the only way you can get a really high capture rate. What's the problem with having email um, if you're a healthcare provider? You probably need an antivirus at your mail gateway. That's a problem, right? Um, and so I've seen this, uh, this sort of attack in production before in my own environments where people, where people will um, shift files to um, you know, a mail server hoping that it's all just one big EC2 instance, which oftentimes it, it is, um, and they can just exploit privileges like that. Never deploy Sophos products to devices that cannot be updated easily. Healthcare, this is a huge problem. Um, the average time to update is, is very, very long in healthcare, and even the lifetime. He says, it took them several months to fix it, which they did so by changing apples on the directory. And so this is not unusual for antivirus vendors. It takes a long time for these updates to go. And so you know, by the time that update is released, maybe a healthcare organization is already through a different update window, and so then they have to delay it even more. It can take a year plus for you to make any sort of significant um, action on this. That's a problem. This is his ESET paper, um, and, and I'm, I'm using Tavis's work as an example because it's high profile, there's a lot of legitimacy there, and there's a proof of concept code out there. But there are many other examples. There's um, one uh, teenager who had a blog who was going after Bitdefender's engine, and so you have like um, with Bitdefender specifically, you have the integer overflow that was reported by the Zero Day Initiative. That was really bad. There was a blog talking about um, engine ex exploits in Bitdefender back in 2017. Plus, this, uh, this person uh, provided ASMR bypasses, and so if you thought that was a great mitigation, that was also a problem. Um, but this is the, the ESET paper, and so essentially what he does uh, is he loads a web page, and everything just explodes, right? So, so this is a problem, and you can see the proof of concept code, you can run this for yourself. This is all real stuff, and that's what's happening all the time. So he says in this paper that ESET can be completely compromised, uh, a complete compromise would allow reading, modifying, or deleting any files on the system regardless of access rights, right? And so when you're talking about running an attack like the MRI, you know, they have a lot going on there. They are making a lot of noise in the system. You need a lot of permission and privileges to do that. And so how do you get to that point, right? You can obviously fish, but, you know, if, when you get that, you know, core, close to the core, it's going to be probably a little more hardened. Um, and so antivirus is a great way to do that. That's how I would do it. There would be zero indication of compromise as disk I.O. is a normal part of the operating operation of the system. There is zero user interaction required. So these aren't some dystopian risks that you know, may or may not be happening. Like this is research that has been published for years now and we know this is a problem in healthcare and the life sciences. And so this also from NIST uh, 1808. Um, this is essentially the best advice that you get for protecting these mission critical uh, clinical workloads. Like this, this, this is it. You have a standard parameter network and then you have endpoint protection. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, we mentioned PSA, Bitdefender, Sophos, you know, semantic is on point. But thanks to some guy named Dallas on LinkedIn who shared this post, just as I was making this, uh, this presentation, oh look, it looks like somebody just figured it out. They have uh, an exploit for um, semantic that they're going to push proof of concept code out, uh, and it took, what is it, 140 days uh, for them to fix it? Like, this is a real problem. You know, if you're in here, this isn't just, this isn't rare stuff that you have to look really hard to get. This isn't something that you have to work really hard to make a, you know, working exploit. This is you running a fuzzer, knowing some basic exploit development, knowing that ASLR isn't a problem because your target's running Windows XP, and these protection um, softwares uh, don't use ASLR anyway most of the time. I mean, this is real stuff that's happening right now. And so why is antivirus such a big part of this talk? And we're gonna, all, we're gonna tie all this in and talk about um, more of the, the specifics of the attacks you can do. 
is this thing. How many of you recognize this if you work in healthcare? Protection from malicious software, procedures for guarding against detecting and reporting malicious software. Your compliance team is going to tell you this is an antivirus. You need an antivirus, some sort of endpoint protection. It is what it is. It's just everywhere. Um, and HIPAA is, uh, you know, it's a federal regulation. You can't say no. The compliance team will be very conservative. And how do you make a case against, uh, you know, your, your legal department saying just do this? Right? It is what it is. So you can say, okay, well, there are a bunch of other protection mechanisms out there. You can deploy Cisco ASAs, and you can do all of this security appliances. There's a lot out there that you can use. Well, here's CVs from uh, 2018. How many of you remember the, the whole Cisco debacle with being able to, um, yeah? So there, there are a few of you here, right? And so you could say, well, we have all these things, and we have you know, SSL VPN, and that's protecting access. So like when I, I, I do bug bounty sometimes, and I, I did one for some unnamed federal agency, they use SSL VPNs extensively um, for government. They also use it extensively in healthcare for some applications, becoming more and more common. And so you can say, okay, how can I get around this? Well, people are getting around it all the time. This is just one example of this happening. Right? This isn't some one-off outlier. Like people are looking at these systems and realizing the, the actual code that's running this stuff is, is really old and it's written with performance in mind and um, it's written by people who don't have a security background and don't have any mandate to make it secure. Right? And so CNC++, known for its spectacular uh, memory safeness, uh, is used in almost all of these products. Um, and so, you know, while we want to rely so much on, on the advanced security features of CNC++, sometimes we can't do that if people get around it. And so that, that's kind of the problem. And this was a great talk, DEF CON 23, by uh, Scott Urban and Mark Colau uh, about um, medical devices. And this, this slide really stood out to me. I think it's something that needs to be talked about more in the industry. Malicious intent is not a prerequisite to patient safety issues, right? And so you can cause a lot of damage. You can shut down an entire hospital. And we saw that with WannaCry. You, you guys remember the, the, you know, what the UK was like after WannaCry? Everything shut down, right? And what if you don't have a system in place to go to manual procedures? That's becoming more and more of the case, right? So you don't need somebody who's intentionally trying to, to shut down a health system to cause all of this damage. And so I, I wanted to, to tie all of this back. And so um, these, these are uh, siblings uh, who were cured of the bubble boy disease. And so if you don't know, uh, bubble boy disease is uh, named after a um, boy who was had this disease called skid, and they wanted before there was any remedy or cure, they literally put him in a bubble. Has anyone seen that documentary? Yeah, so one person has. Um, so when I was at Fred Hodge, this is what I worked on. I worked on X skid. So skid is severe combined immunodeficiency, and the only way you can treat it is through gene therapy. There's no other cure. You're born without an immune system. And so how did we get to this point that um, they're being cured? Well, there's a process involved. So okay, we just talked about all the medical devices and the sequencers. Why does this all matter? How can it be attacked? Let's think about how this is all done. The first step of the process is you need to identify that the um, person has um, the disease. And so you run it through all this equipment that generates results that you then trust. There's no way to verify that the uh, integrity of the data is there, right? There's no way for you to really know is what I'm getting what I should actually be seeing. Then, for this particular case, what you need to do is you need to fully ablate the person. That means you have to shoot high-intensity radiation into their body and destroy their immune system and get rid of their bone marrow, right? But previously, you would take some bone marrow, and then you, you would use gene therapy to change their stem cells so that you can correct the genetic mutation that causes this, right? So to do that, you're using sequencing, you're using PCRs, you're using all of this equipment. Um, you know, you're relying on your machine for full ablation uh, to give you the right intensity of uh, radiation. But what if it doesn't? Like, what, what if it doesn't? That's a problem. What if your sequencer produces results that don't make sense or that aren't being honest to you? What if your MRI, you know, doesn't show a tumor? That's the problem, right? And so you would the gene edit these uh, cells, you would put it back into the body, and then some percentage of those cells will have the correct uh, version of the gene and be 
because they're stronger and they have more likelihood to survive, um, that's going to um, take over and it's going to exponentially, those cells will exponentially grow, and then you'll eventually get an immune system because you fix that genetic mutation. There's a process to get there. And so uh, this is also from the Fred Hutch. So I was at the, the Keen lab, so I'm just using uh, their work as an example. Um, this is one of the, the uh, postdocs there. Um, and essentially modified stem cells to generate a compound that makes HIV weaker. And the same process goes into that, right? The same process goes into um, you uh, modifying the cells and verifying that they're there, and then you put it back into the body. And have any of you heard of this gene editing in a box? This is real. So this is uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Adair. Um, uh, she was, uh, she's also part of the clinical research division at Fred Hodge. And it's essentially a tool, a medical device, that essentially automates the process of gene modification. This stuff is so cool and next level. But the point is, in 2003, $5 billion to, sing to sequence a single genome. Now we have gene engineering um, or, or gene therapy in a box, right? So this was back in 2016, it's probably far more advanced now. And so the point I'm trying to make isn't that people are going around ruining these sequencers, but healthcare today is not the healthcare of tomorrow. And we're using now gene editing to combat cancer. We're making yourself uh, more resistant to chemotherapy. All of these devices and tools are used for that, but oftentimes it involves stem cells. That's controversial, and there's nation state involvement in this. It's going to become a problem eventually, and I just want people to be aware of it. That you should be looking at these tools in the context in which they're used. You should be looking 10 years from now, and you should be thinking about if somebody really wanted to wreak havoc, how hard would it be, accidental or, or otherwise? Are you talking about CRISPR and Cas9 with that uh, box? Uh, the, you could use any, so you can use K-Lens, you can use uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is what I worked on. Um, you can use uh, zinc fingers. It doesn't really matter, right? So, so the key there is really just you need to um, get the, you use a virus to, to carry that stuff, and then you electrocute it into cells. And so as long as you can get the electrocution and that sort of letting the virus enter the cells to modify them, then it's yeah. But you can use just about anything, which is why it's so powerful and why more people are going to use stuff like that. It, it costs under $300,000 to make. So uh, I only have a few more minutes. Uh, I want to end on a positive, happy note. Um, my first recommendation is have a plan and practice it. So this was uh, University of Arizona, where they said, we're going to do a test run on not having a CT scanner. Think about that. Somebody might introduce malware into your system that targets antivirus um, and shut everything down. Denial of service, you don't need exploit shops to do that. Like You literally just run a fuzzer and run a fuzzer until you find something that crashes everything. Okay, so practice that. And, and so I love that they're uh, publicizing that and um, practicing that. My second recommendation is if you're having trouble getting people to understand what the problem is uh, or to make you know, um, systemic change within the organization, speak their language. And so in Red Team often, you know, the status quo is you're trying to achieve an objective and you do it the easiest way possible. If you're having, if you're an internal red team and you're having trouble getting people to listen, if you tell an executive that the patient reported outcomes uh, platform was owned or that you, uh, you have proof of concept that you could shut down an entire clinical ward or modify um, a genome sequence that a researcher is working on, like think if an institution found out um, you know, their devices were compromised a year prior, and now they have no way to tell whether or not the work they've been doing for the past year is legit or not. Like, you don't know, it's all just like Ubuntu 14, just processing the stuff, and you can put USBs in it, and it, it puts data on your USB, and you can take data, you know, put your data onto the machine. Like, who knows what's going on there? Like, that can ruin your brand. So, so be creative about that process. Third recommendation is, Devices are devices, metaphor. Otherwise, inventory them, understand how they're used, and threat model them based off of current research. If you're not thinking about how antivirus can be, antiviruses can be used as, um, a, 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 as an attack vector, people are already doing this. And so the people I've spoken to in, in the incident response field, nobody will give me specifics because they sign NDAs that will just blow your head off. Um, but I, I've gotten multiple confirmations that this is happening in large uh, academic research centers 
uh, in particular. And so antiviruses are a target, and so not just antiviruses, but threat models based off of current research, you know what's going on, and use that in the threat model. And so you can say, okay, well, it's easy to say, understand and inventory it, Find a partner in your organization that does research. The main source of funding in these uh, institutions, whether it's a big hospital or academic center, are R01 grants. So look that up, find out for every lab who's, who's managing this, because a lab manager is buying this equipment and putting it on your network, and nobody knows if it's cloud connected or not. Fifth recommendation is we need SSO for healthcare, like really bad. If you're if you're a vendor or you know someone who's a vendor, you're gonna make a fortune doing this. But not just uh, or sorry, not SSO but zero trust. If you're just doing SSO, that's great, but we need like hardcore zero trust. The whole thing, not just a couple of parts of it, but like the entire thing needs to be reworked eventually in the next decade or two for zero trust. The sixth recommendation, if you're a vendor, uh, the reason antivirus is everywhere and, and there's a lot of additional risk you don't really need when it, you know, maybe you have a good alternative is it's, it's uh, complicated. So if you're a vendor, find solutions that incorporate security into compliance and make compliance easier. Seventh recommendation is ask yourself basic questions like, how do I know that our MRI is giving us good results? And if you don't have a good answer for that, be honest about that and use that for your advantage. Don't use the reasoning of, okay, well, nobody's gonna target this, so it's it's no big deal. Um, just be honest about it and use that to your advantage. The eighth recommendation, and I talked about this uh, earlier, healthcare today is different than what it's gonna be like 10 years from now, is integration of life sciences and healthcare. Um, medical devices that we think like cardiac implants, that's one piece of the puzzle. Nobody's looking at the security of these devices. They're connected to your core networks. You can get from a VLAN on clinical research up until, you know, up to your core network. You can get the remote access tools. Like this stuff is not complicated. Anybody can do it if they put some time into it. And so start, start thinking about how that's all playing out and what devices you're putting into your network. Um, and with that, the, the talk was a, a little bit more rushed than um, I thought it would be. Um, and so uh, that's it. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the platform to talk about this stuff. Uh, any questions? I, I don't have a question. Just a general comment for the audience here is that these medical devices uh, require FDA approval before they can be marketed, which is very time consuming and costly. And it also requires to not make any changes to the device at all after that approval is done until the next approval is done, which could be years down the line. Actually, not Actually, true. That's, there you go. Thank you. Not <laughs> true at all. Uh, five tenths. K certification changed years ago to where they actually have to be doing kind of a best effort is what it amounts to, to where the FDA says you do not, for security purposes, you do not have to go back through the recertification process. Okay, okay that's good to know because what I was getting at is if there's a vulnerability in some of these machines, it's probably still there that you play with. I, I, I've helped an act change at large uh, two-letter healthcare companies um, that using that exact methodology and going through uh, US CERT and having them get involved. So one, one thing I would add is that there's still, the certain medical device manufacturers are not good at working with researchers. So if you get into this line of work, be very focused on helping them. Do not be adversarial because that's going to backfire. Um, and if you don't get good results, report it to the FDA. So that's what happened with St. Jude's with their cardiac implants, is they weren't able to verify the vulnerability. Um, and so they told the researchers, hey, there's nothing there. Researchers went to FDA. FDA uh, investigated, they confirmed the vulnerabilities, and then St. Jude's issued a firmware update. Um, and so like, it, there, there's an avenue, but it's still, it's, it's a lot less mature than in other, other industries. That brings up, one of the uh, medical doctors that I've worked with that talks a lot about the vulnerabilities in medical devices brings up very good points. So I'm gonna throw it out to you and see how you answer it. I have my own answers. But he is, and he's on the hacker side. Uh, he probably, is, or I don't know who he is, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head at the moment. But he has said that with medical devices, and as vulnerable as they are, particularly the St. Jude's heart uh, pacemaker, there is a certain number of reinfections that occur and people get hurt and 
possibly die when they have to get that firmware updated on their pacemaker. So that's a known element. They know that that's going to happen to a, a certain amount of people. They're going to die, they're going to be infected. But there is a, a not a known number of people that have had problems with these devices being compromised. So how, how do you answer that question of how do we quantify this unknown security risk that may kill you versus this known, you're actually going to get an infection. We know a certain number of people are actually going to get infections and a certain number of people are going to die to upgrade this firmware to protect against this unknown security risk. Yeah, so within healthcare and the life sciences in particular, this is a problem that has to be fixed over the course of 10, 20 years. There is no short-term fix. You can't tell somebody, well, we're going to disregard all clinical recommendations for the sake of this unknown um, security risk where somebody may or may not die when you know somebody will. And so this is, this is a, a risk management question. Um, I, I think more holistically, um, there's nothing, practically speaking, that we can do in the short term to address that because these things are already in patients and they're going to stay in patients for a long time. And so at that point, you have to ask yourself the question of what is the best thing I can do, right? There is no perfect solution, but the, probably the best thing that you can do is just try to bring awareness to these issues, help manufacturers, um, you know, design products in the future with these considerations in mind, advance the technology and um, get to a better state um, you know, in the future. And I, I, I think it's, again, the, top, the, the title of this talk is the offensive path, less travel for a reason. These things aren't happening at scale um, in the way that maybe they will in the future, and that's a good thing. And so while we still have a really good opportunity to think about these problems and uh, come up and roll out long-term solutions, like we should absolutely do that. And what, what inspired me to give this talk in particular is I want to create a base point for where, sh where should you be looking at? Um, and so hopefully that's going to drive some interest and in change in the future. But that's, that's, you know, that's the problem, right? If you get rid of Windows XP, your clinical workflows go down, right? And, and so I'm not... I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to. I don't want it to come off as I'm, uh, you know, berating these institutions for using antivirus or, or this or that. I want to address the problem and to say that if you're in a you know, medical center or a clinic, like you don't have a better choice, and that's the problem. It's like, what else are you going to do? Um, so it's a, it's a long term play. I think you that because this doesn't just become medical. Thing instrumentation. Yeah. Whether it's uh, tools with. Used in the physics research, the physics department. Or exactly. we, we see this a lot, of, a lot in higher ed too. Well, I can't update it because the vendor won't issue drivers for anything but XP, and I don't have three million dollars to buy an instrument. Yep. And so, I mean, I don't know. Other than maybe also on the contracting end, being more aware of this, so that in those contracts, when you buy this equipment, when you buy uh, the choice of a choice. But that there's stipulations about how this is going to be, you know, how this is going to be <coughs> over the life cycle of that tool. Yep. And so that that's a great point. Like you mentioned, um, physics, it, it's it's everything, right? It's pharmaceutical development, it's environmental biology, um, it, it touches just about everything. And um, like the now it, what. what the way I like to think about it is 10 years ago, if you wanted to learn how to do exploits, you know, like what would you do, right? Like you, you had conferences you could go to, some books you could buy. Now you can literally find a YouTube series on how to, um, you know, what AFL is, how to configure it, how to run it. Uh, you have books on exploitations that talk about rock gadgets in more detail than ever before in history. Like you can go from not really knowing much um, to, being pretty proficient in a year or two. And there was a talk at, I think, Black Hat or Def Con last year about um, browser exploitation where, you know, the person says, like, I don't know anything about browsers, but I just kind of picked up on it. And so, like, people are starting to pay more attention, and it's going to affect every industry in a different way. But there, there's already activity there. Like, people are already using antiviruses. They're already looking at medical devices. Hobbyists are now getting into it. Like, there, there has to be. Um, at least some sort of good conversation about it. Look at we're out of time.
Perfect. Thank you. Perfect.